The reading this morning is taken from Genesis chapter 4. I would like for you to listen for the phrase, the Lord, as it's used several times in this passage, but be listening for it. Starting with Genesis 1 from the New Revised Standard Version. Now the man knew his wife Eve, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have produced a man with the help of the Lord. Next she bore his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of sheep, and Cain a tiller of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel, for his part, brought the firstlings of his flock, their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel in his offering, but for Cain in his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his countenance fell. The Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door. Its desire is for you, but you must master it. Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? He said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield to you its strength. You will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Today you have driven me away from the soil, and I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth and anyone who meets me will kill me. Then the Lord said to him, Not so. Whoever kills Cain will suffer a sevenfold vengeance. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, so that no one who came upon him would kill him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord, and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch, and he built a city and named it Enoch after his son Enoch. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad was the father of Mehujael, and Mehujael the father of Methushael, and Methushael the father of Lamech. Lamech took two wives. The name of one was Ada, and the name of the other was Zillah. Ada bore Jabel. He was the ancestor of those who live in tents and have livestock. His brother's name was Jubal. He was the ancestor of all those who play the lyre and pipe. Zillah bore Tubal Cain, who made all kinds of bronze and iron tools. The sister of Tubal Cain was Naamah. Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, hear my voice. You wives of Lamech, listen to what I say. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy-sevenfold. Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and named him Seth, for she said, God has appointed for me another child instead of Abel, because Cain killed him. To Seth also a son was born, and he named him Enosh. At that time, people began to invoke, invoke the name of the Lord. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. A depressing reading, by and large. Life east of Eden does get complicated. It made me think of the poem that William Butler Yeats wrote in 1921, The Second Coming. It's sometimes referred to as the most quoted poem and misquoted poem uh, ever written. So I hope I don't go into misquoting it. 
The context in which Yeats wrote that poem, The Second Coming, is in the aftermath of World War I, uh, the Russian Revolution, and the Easter Rebellion in his native Ireland, where a lot of blood had been shed and the world just seemed to be in upheaval. The poem reads this way. Turning and turning in the widening jar, the falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed and everywhere. The ceremony of innocence is drowned. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. In the next stanza, he has a thought that some revelation must be at hand. And then he speaks of the second coming. But then immediately he imagines a beast that is arising from the desert that is shaped like a lion and it has the head of a man. And it's lumbering or slouching, not driving, but just sort of this slouching toward Bethlehem. That theme has been picked up on, as I said, and quoted by many authors. Joan Ditteron, uh, in 1967, went to Hyatt Asbury in San Francisco, where the social revolution led by the hippies was taking place. She spent a spring and summer among them, and she wrote an essay titled, Slouching Toward Bethlehem, pulling on this point. In it, she noted that a lot of those in that self, uh, social revelation in Hyatt Asbury were young runaways who had found home too demanding and too restrictive, and they wanted to get away from everything and had fallen for the lie that everything is free. Peace and love and self-fulfillment. As she talked to those children, one of them told her, or told her that she had run away from home because her parents' discipline, and I use that in a very positive way, her parents' discipline was so restrictive that they made her go to church. Their discipline happened to be a spiritual practice that she found restrictive. Ditterin started that essay drawing on this poem, not only in its title, but saying that the center has broken. The falcon in its spiraling jar had moved farther and farther away from the falconer, and it could not hear the voice, and the center had broken. Those in Hyatt Asbury preached a gospel of love and peace and freedom. And Didion comments, at some point between 1945 and 1967, that happens to be my generation, we had somehow neglected to tell these children the rules of the game we happened to be playing. So the social revolution that centered in Hyatt Asbury turned out not to be free, but very costly because it was life lived east of Eden, away from the center. The falcon could no longer hear the voice of the falconer. In 1985, Neil Postman also drew on this title. Many of you have read it, his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death. He has one chapter titled, Shuffle Off to Bethlehem. What Postman is denouncing and pointing out in um, his book, Amusing Ourselves to Death, is that television as a medium cannot carry a message of substance because it's a medium of entertainment. But in his chapter of Shuffle Off to Bethlehem, he's talking about the church that has started following the entertainment model and how it is affecting its message especially in religious broadcasting. And he quotes the executive director of the National Religious Broadcasters Association who said, you can get your share, speaking to the church and religious broadcasters, you can get your share of the audience only by offering people what they want. Now, Postman replies to this. You will note, he says, I am sure, 
that this is an unusual relig religious credo. There is not a great religious leader, from the Buddha to Moses to Jesus to Muhammad to Luther, who offered people what they want, only what they need. I believe I am not mistaken in saying that Christianity is a demand, demanding and serious religion. When it is delivered as easy and amusing, it is another kind of religion altogether. I think Postman would agree that even the church must navigate life lived east of Eden. Our worship can fall into that pattern as well. And it has trouble carrying the message. In Genesis 4, we find life as it's first lived east of Eden. And it starts on a joyous note, even though they've been expelled from the garden. Because east of Eden, Eve bears a child. She and Adam have come together in intimate union. But she says, with the Lord's help, I have borne this child. But the joy quickly descends into tragedy because Adam and Eve had been told in the garden, if you touch that fruit, if you eat that fruit in the tree at the middle, you will surely die. But they didn't die immediately. And I wonder if the death that they experienced when Cain killed Abel was even more deadly and deeper than their own death would fill later. Life east of Eden is extremely difficult. As I began the reading this morning, I asked you to listen for the number of times the word Lord is used. In the first 16 verses, it's used 10 times. Then over the next 7 verses, the Lord is not mentioned again. And that's when Lamech's taunt song comes out. It sounds a little bit like soldiers getting ready to go into battle or an athletic team getting ready for a game or a heavy metal rock band singing or maybe a gangster rapper. rapper. But talking about Lamech saying to his wives, there was a man that injured me and I killed him and a young boy that just touched me and I killed him. If Cain got sevenfold vengeance, I'll get seventy-sevenfold. Where the Lord is absent, life degenerates. And life is very complicated away from the center, east of Eden. Yeats knows the descendants of Cain and Lamech well when he observes, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of of passionate intensity. But God does not abandon us east of Eden. Even in this story of tragedy and of fall, we see that although Cain chooses to go out of the presence of the Lord, the Lord does not abandon us. He continues to be present. He puts a mark on Cain. That's a mark of grace, I think. It's a protective mark. And maybe using C.S. Lewis's term, it's a severe mercy. Or Bonhoeffer's term, it's definitely not cheap grace. But God's grace is present even with Cain when Cain walks away from the presence of God. Even his children bring great culture into the world. But we know that that comes with liabilities if it's not lived at the center. <coughs> first cowboys appear. Believe it or not, the first cowboys appear here in Genesis 4. As they begin to herd cattle and sheep and take care of it, music is developed. Metal is shaped into tools. But we know that all of that east of Eden can also be perverted and taken away from God's grace. And Genesis 4 finally ends on a hopeful note. Because from Seth's line, the new child, we hear that at that time people began to evoke the name of the Lord, even east of Eden. So the Lord again appears. A new line is there. 
And from that line will come Noah. And what we find east of Eden is that we are not abandoned, that God can be sought, that God can be found, and that God wants us to live in loving relationship with Him and with one another. A few years ago, I was in a Walmart in Lubbock, and I noticed some children walking down the aisle, and I noticed the first one had a smudge on its forehead. And I thought, man, some parents aren't doing a very good job here. Then I saw more children with a smudge on their forehead, and I'm slow, but I realized that it was Ask Wednesday, and that these children had been to church, and the priest had put the sign of the cross on their forehead, and it was sort of smeared and spreading out. In some ways, I'm a little envious of those traditions that have such rich symbolism in their rituals. Now, I know those rituals, just like anything in culture, can degenerate and become empty. But even in my tradition, I know that we have a symbol that we can remember and look to, and that's our baptisms. Because in our baptisms, we have been marked with a sign and with the blood of Jesus that unlike the blood that Cain shed from Abel, brings peace and not a curse. Yesterday, I expect that many, if not all of us, observed the Lord's Supper during worship. And there again, we were reminded of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And that through our baptisms into life in Him, we live in that hope of the resurrection. So even though life east of Eden is very difficult and complicated, we're reminded that God does not abandon us and that He stays with us. And he has given us symbols to remind us of His love and His care and that we can live with the hope of the resurrection. So we pray today, and I ask you to join me. Lord, You called our world into being with great power, much love, and great grace. You gave us our very breath and entrusted us to be your partners in the care of your creation. You gave us freedom to live and love if we choose. But you also laid down boundaries to guide and protect us as we live our lives alongside you, other people, and your creation. Help us to see, Lord, the consequences of each choice we make. That it leads either to life with you or death apart from you. And give us the courage and wisdom to choose life in the name of Jesus who chose life and conquered death. And all God's people say, Amen.